Christ be with you. And also with you.
And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine <coughs> said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell to his face on the ground. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I strongly believe that the story of David and Goliath is one of a handful of stories that is known worldwide and is used in both religious and secular circles. Did you know that there are several species of animals that have the name Goliath in their own names, indicating their unusually large stature? TV series, fiction novels, games, songs, even roller coasters have the name Goliath. The story of David and Goliath promises to stay within the human lexicon for many, many, many centuries. Why? Because as long as there is a persistence in the presence of seemingly powerful and incorruptible giants of industry, politics, and even religion. You know, my good friend John Calvin, he resonated with David and undoubtedly found comfort when he stood before the Goliath of his time, the medieval Catholic Church. And like I said last Sunday, the devil likes to place before us Goliaths who intimidate us through size, glamour, or aggression. But we also saw how God equips, how God empowers and God enlightens his faithful when they come against these Goliaths. You see, the reason the story David and Goliath is known worldwide is because of the simple yet powerful message of encouragement. Why is it that the human race finds this story so encouraging? Well, it has to do with an unexpected hero. There once was a church, not too different from ours, and before worship started, there came in a gentleman, a biker. Yeah, you know what I mean. He had the long braided hair, the thick beard, he had the leather vest, the biker emblems, the tattoos, the whole nine yards. Now, the congregation had never seen him before, and, and though the church is open to everyone, many of the members eyed him with suspicion and gave him a wide breath. 
Now the service started as usual, and after a time of praise and worship, the pastor stands up and tells the congregation that the day's sermon will be delivered by a guest preacher. Now the church was surprised by this because they did not see another preacher up front with their pastor. And it was at that time when this biker guy stood up and he came forward and delivered a message on not judging books by their covers. <laughs> So while no one in that congregation would ever admit to it, many of them thought that this rough and tough, hell's angel looking guy couldn't be a Christian, let alone a preacher. He sure enough didn't look the part. And yet his message was not only timely, but extremely moving. <coughs> now King Saul made a similar assumption when David came into his war tent expressing his compulsion to champion Israel as Goliath's challenger. Saul thought, well, surely this young man has the gumption to stand against this Philistine, but he lacks the proper implements of war. Now, Samuel doesn't tell us why Saul dresses David in his armor, but we can guess it was because he assumed one strike from Goliath's spear would do David in. Now, did you notice that the prophet is making a parallel between Goliath's armor and Saul's? Helmet of bronze, coat of mail, and a weapon. In Saul's eyes, the only way to combat this enemy is by mirroring his tactics. Now, isn't that exactly what the devil wants? He wants us to retaliate using his tactics. So we can play his game using his rules. The moment we react with avarice, anger, or acquiescence is the moment we play right into the enemy's hands. Instead of relying on the arms and armor of the world, David turns <coughs> to tried and tested armaments. His staff, his slingshot, and five smooth <coughs> They are all with which David arms himself. Now, it's not that the helmet, mail, and sword were an act for battle. The reason David rejects Saul's ordinances is because he had not tested them. You see, David's true reliance was not on tools, but on God. Remember, it was the Lord who delivered him from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. What David knew was tried and true was God's provisions. And what God provides is often contrary to human conventions. Conventional wisdom states that equal or greater force is required to overcome a foe. In Saul's mind, the only way to logically defeat Goliath is by, at the very least, arming and armoring oneself equally with Goliath. But human logic doesn't work with God. In his opening statements to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul draws the church's attention to, the to Christ, who is the wisdom of God. He even goes on to say in allegory, if God had any foolishness within him or, or any weakness within him, even those would be wiser and stronger than the strength and wisdom of the entire human race. God's sovereignty and holiness are what make him the greatest force in the world. Sovereignty and holiness are what make God, God. And what makes him our God, the one to whom we can call Abba, Father, is his steadfast love and salvation. So the mighty and awesome and awful force that is God is channeled on our side by God's gift of faith. This is why David was able to go and face the Philistine giant. 
His trust was not in the sword or armor or even the slingshot. His trust was in God's ultimate power over everything. He says as much as he confronts Goliath. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You see, it's not that Goliath defied Israel. He defied the God of Israel and the God of this world. All the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly, everyone gathered here today, says David, may know that the Lord saves not with the sword and the spear. God doesn't need our arms and armor. In fact, he doesn't even need us at all. God uses us, and we should be pleased to be molded by the potter. But remember, it is always to his glory and not our own. David was Israel's unexpected hero that day because his heart and motives were pointed in the right direction toward God. So church, I ask you, how are you making yourself a vessel for the Lord? Are you clothing yourself with pride, greed, and lust? Or are you clothing yourself with humility, generosity, and piety? Where are your motives directed? Do you do good works to lift yourself up to appear more generous than you are? Or do you do or do your good deeds stem from a rightly ordered relationship with God? Do you armor yourself in the ways that the world is armored? With cynicism, suspicion, and hard-heartedness? Or have you taken up the whole armor of God? The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith. The helmet of salvation and the sword that is the word <coughs> of God. Look at those for a brief moment. The armor of God, those accoutrements, the things with which God, the Christian, is to be covered are from top to bottom. Salvation, righteousness, truth, and peace. The arms of God, those instruments with which the Christian bears witness and lives daily, are faith and scripture. Now that's a whole sermon there, so for now I want to leave you with these questions. Are you wearing and displaying God's salvation and God's righteousness? Do you live out God's truth and God's peace? Are you molded by God's faith and God's word? Let us pray. O King Eternal, you oversee this world and you provide for our daily living. When we forget this, we invite the devil to flood our minds with false information. When our guard is down, we are susceptible to our enemy's taunts and attacks. Daily, we need reminding that a faith, a hope, and a trust in our devices and in human conventions, well, those are the deepest fault. Our trust should be in you alone, O God. Help us to be focused as David was focused, always having you and your glory in mind. May we not be distracted by the trappings of humanity or the employees of the enemy. Rather, may we be clothed with the whole armor of God, that we may be faithful and zealous disciples of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And now, friends, 
In response to God's word, I invite you to stand and sing hymn number 163, Lord, our Lord, thy glorious name.
transforming God, thank you for the blessing of honest labor through which you have provided these gifts for our hands to share. We dedicate them now as an expression of our love for you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now we enter the part of our service where we lift up prayers for our communities, our families, our friends, and the world. Are there any additional prayer requests to lift up at this time? Yes, I'd like to encourage my brother Craig. He had suffered a massive stroke while he was traveling abroad. Um, he is now back in the States, but being treated here. Yes, we certainly have done, brother Craig. I'd like to pray Sherry Foster, who's up in Charlottesville at the present. She's doing pretty well, but she's going back and forth to the hospital there. Your friend Sherry Foster, who's in the hospital, or going back and forth. Yes. Our sister Marilyn was in the hospital. Your sister Marilyn, mm -hmm. so thank you for our prayers. Thank you. Yes. Brandon uh, Bowers, uh, Jan Sport, um, he's having some health issues. And also to um, rejoice in Olivia uh, Griffin's recovery and his slowly progressing, but uh, the recovery is imminent. Sure. We certainly appreciate those. And tell me the names again. Uh, Lee Griffin. Lee Griffin. And Janice Fort. And Janice Fort. And we certainly praise the Lord for your recovery and that you all are here with us. Pastor Ed, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank everybody uh, in this church family for all your prayers, your concerns, and your support during these days of uh, hardship for my wife, and a special thanks to you, Carolyn, for the wheelchair. <laughs> Welcome. We'll certainly keep you in our prayers and that the recovery is speedy. Thanks. Yes, Jean. There's a blood mobile tomorrow, Monday, at Lane Memorial for those who can give blood. Sure. So, blood mobile is coming to Lane tomorrow. Thank you. Mark. The family in, uh, of Tim Sisler, a good friend of mine. What was the last name? Sorry, Tim. Sisler. Tim Sisler. He passed his last week. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Others. Seeing none, let us bring these prayers to the Lord. <coughs> Omnipresent God, we lift our voice to you. Drawn by your steadfast love and confident in your great power to redeem, we pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of your creation. We wait for you, O oh Lord. In your word, we hope. Bless your church to bring your gospel to those both near and far, from the furthest reaches of this planet to the neighbors around the corner. We wait for you, O oh Lord. In your word, we hope. Redeem your creation from the wilderness of sin and death to the flourishing of righteousness and life. We wait for you, O Lord, in your word we hope. Restore peace with mercy and truth, with trust in our nations and our neighborhoods. We wait for you, O Lord. In your word, we hope. Raise up those who cry from the depths of poverty, oppression, illness, and despair. We wait for you, O Lord. In your word, we Help us to put away bitterness and wrath, anger and slander. Be kind to one another, living in love as you have loved us. But we wait for you, O Lord, in your word we hope.
Thank you for our ancestors in the faith. Those who lived and worshipped you once on this earth. Now worship and live with you eternally in heaven. We wait for you, O Lord. In your word, we pray. We commit our prayers to God with that prayer which Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, friends, I invite you to stand and sing our final hymn, number 139, Come, Thou Almighty.